So it has come to my attention that maybe my audience might like to see a video that highlights the world of microbrands. It's kind of a subjective term among enthusiasts, but tries to be objective by stating the company is small, independent, and only produces watches in small numbers. They're typically affordable, and they also purchase movements from industry suppliers or outsource production entirely, but that's not always the case. So what blurs the line between micro and name brand? I think as of now, we can leave it as a subjective opinion because one person's take may be different than another, and there are no set parameters or exact numbers that constitute whether or not it's a true microbrand. So here's my subjective collection of what I consider watches that lean toward the microbrand title. Mostly, I just want to perhaps educate or inspire someone that may prefer a little diversity in their collection from huge name brands. We shall begin with a brand that has a military aviation target audience. They are none other than Aviate. It is a fairly new company founded in 2012 who focuses on planes, people, and military history. It's no zero west, but we'll talk about them another day. I think the company has a fairly lucrative future due to the popularity of this field and I was pleasantly surprised to see that prices are also fairly reasonable, but is it a bit too gimmicky for my collection? Let's find out now. The first model of focus today is the Spitfire Type 300 Automatic that truly makes for a great gift watch. I say that because it's not exactly my cup of coffee, however, it has enough gimmick to make me appreciate its place in my microbrand collection. It has a 42mm case size, which feels true to its size. 13.6mm thickness, which is a bit hefty on the wrist, and the 50mm lug to lug really fans this one out, making it a bit bulky. It does have a sapphire crystal, 50 meters of water resistance, and AR coating that makes the dial completely legible. The company also gives you a black stainless steel bracelet option, or a leather band option, which I have chosen to display this with. When illuminated, the Swiss Luminova does its job adequately, but I wonder why they chose to brighten the minutes indicators and not the hours. Just a minor gripe here. The dial is said to be inspired by the readout and dials inside of a Spitfire cockpit, so that is a nice nod to its origins. For the greatest gimmick of all, we turn it over to see that the rotor has taken shape of the plane that this watch pays tribute to. Underneath that, we have a Miyota 8218 automatic movement that has some minor decoration and provides a date complication and small seconds function with 21 joules and beating at 3 hertz. Also, we have a 40 hour power reserve, but no hacking unfortunately. I really think this rotor sells the watch. It's fairly decent otherwise, just not the perfect space holder for me. On my 6 and 3 quarter inch wrist, it wears a bit too bulky as I stated earlier, and I think it's the vertical thickness that does it in. If we look head on at the crown, we can see yet another nod to the Spitfire with that bulbous nose resembling the propeller and some discreet upward etchings to capture the shape of the wings you would see on the aircraft. No doubt, a nice touch, but these are things you almost have to know about ahead of time before you can truly appreciate what they've gone for here. It's a fun novelty watch in my opinion, and I'm glad to showcase it for you, but I would probably rather spend my cash on something I would gravitate toward more in my daily rotation and let this remain a novelty. For watch number two, it may be debatable whether or not this would be considered a microbrand, but at one point it definitely was. Founded in 2004, this company has risen in the ranks and become a well-respected company. The fact that every watch is handmade in Switzerland speaks to the quality you get when you wear a Christopher Ward. The ingenuity of the English coupled with the expertise of Swiss watchmaking has recently placed this company into the common pool of big branding. Today we're looking at the version 3 C60 Trident Pro 600. I was surprised how classy this watch comes off even on this nylon strap. The light refraction off this bezel almost makes the watch appear to have facets, even though it doesn't. This particular version has a 600 meter water resistance, which is hard to see with the naked eye, but sure enough, when I took a loop to the dial, there it was. The case is a perfect 40 millimeters with a 47.5 lug width and 13.5 millimeters of thickness. The crystal is sapphire, of course, and the bezel is a satisfying ceramic material that has 120 clicks and a beautiful feel with absolutely no backplay. When you're 2,000 feet down in the ocean, you need good loom, and this version 3 comes with C1X1 Super Luminova that also lights up the bezel this time around. I really must say, you get a lot of bang for your buck here. I paid around $700 total, and like a good escort, I'm seeing where my money went, even in the dark. Reversing our view to the rear of this awesome watch, I'm happy to see the acclaimed raised trident, which also adorns the second hand on the front. 
Underneath that greatness, the watch sports a Salita SW200 movement, beating it 4 hertz and 26 joules, which, if you know movements, should bring a smile to your face and a unident to your pants. This Trident Pro has presence and almost comes off as a dressy watch at first, but nails the sporty look also. I think it all depends on what band you decide to go with. It wears a bit large for a 40mm, so beware if your wrist is below 7 inches. Overall, I really like this one, and I have to boast a little in regards to its depth rating. If you plan a trip to see Arthur Curry in Atlantis, make sure you have the correct earth time to make it home in time for supper. Three watches in, we come to the Cortina 1956 3H Ivory, made by Echo Nutra. Founded post-2008 and focusing on durability and beauty, this microbrand company sets out to test their skills against a fickle demographic of watch connoisseurs. This is one of my first Italian-designed watches with Swiss-made innards, and I am happy to own one of their unique timepieces. So let's do a quick spec tech rundown. We have a 40mm case size with a comfortable 11.9mm of thickness, a 46mm lug to lug, screw down crown with ultra domed sapphire crystal front, and a surprising fixed sapphire bezel. Also 100 meters of water resistance. Some pretty impressive stuff here, but I'm not sure why they opted for this off-white dial. Maybe it has something to do with the 50s and 60s inspiration, but I would have rather seen polar white personally. This has a claimed radium loom on the hours and minutes hand, which may explain the lack of overall loom. Hope they didn't lick the brush this time. The seconds hand has a splash of BGW9 for a nice but also small variance of color. On the reverse side, we see a raised 1956, which bears the logo of the collection, along with some other minor details and some nice circular brushing. A Salita SW200 Elaboré grade movement is found underneath, with a 41 hour power reserve. This watch originally comes with a vintage beige suede strap, which I wasn't a big fan of, so I threw on a Fulmosa racing strap, which changes things up for the better. Again, if they would have given me the polar white dial, I think it would have paired better, but I do appreciate the vibe they were going for. This is the type of watch I will have to choose the appropriate apparel to match, but I'm ready for the challenge. Bring it on, Italy! For the Phoebus varieties, I thought I would do a double whammy and cover both for you at the same time. I featured both of these watches in prior videos, and in my humble opinion, I believe they are two of the best options from this brand. I won't get into any details since I've already featured them, but I will mention that the white dial Eagle Ray made a recent change when they changed that date window from the 3 o'clock to the 6 o'clock position. A change for the better if you ask me. The black meteorite dial still holds the number one spot for me as the best Phoebus ever released to date. It's a spec monster and I truly believe it's the best looking watch they've ever made. This Vulcan Nautique Skin Diver came out of left field and knocked me for a loop. I had not heard of this brand until I perused YouTube for up and coming microbrands. The thing is, they've been around for ages, since 1858 to be exact. How did I miss this company when every watch I've seen by them is a hit? I guess I've never been a president, so I'm a bit naive to their slogan that this is the watch for presidents, but to miss the first company to invent the alarm complication also? I almost hung up my hat as a collector when I found out how influential they truly are. Right away I thought of another brand that's a hit with me, and that brand is Oris. This one has nods to the Diver 65 with its sleek look. If we're comparing apples to apples, I would say the Vulcan beats out the Oris with this model. We're looking at a 38mm case size with a comfy 12.2mm of thickness, double domed sapphire glass with 200 meters of water resistance. The black carbon strap accentuates the beauty of the dial, and the vertical brush case with black ceramic bezel inlay turns me into a volcano, minus the lava. It's almost a one to one of a 1960s model, and it's set to be a classic even today. Super Luminova graces the dial in the exact brilliance of the hour marker placements and hands. You can tell the Swiss played their role in the making of this instant classic. I liken this watch to paranoia. You know, reality on a finer scale. The back of this watch is plain but practically perfect, not too boastful but deliberate in their message. Under the modest yet effective message, we get a powerhouse ETA 2824 automatic movement that beats at 4 Hz, so you'll be hard pressed to see any lag. A modest 38 hour power reserve keeps the lights on just long enough not to run up the bill. 
Now, when I say this beats out the Oris Diver 65, I think I can honestly compare the two since I also own that model. It would be tempting to trade in my Oris for the blue variant dial of this masterpiece, but I'm really trying to keep diversity strong in the collection. This is by far my favorite purchase of the new year and probably contender for the best of the year after all is said and done. It's really hard to give my other watches wrist time when this one keeps whispering sweet nothings into my ear. Enter the Wise Atomascus AD880A, a fairly new micro brand I found from 2008 with some gorgeous dial options and appealing styles. This is my first watch purchase from Thailand, and every watch is hand assembled in Bangkok. The watch is great, and the presentation might be better. It comes with two straps and a few extras inside a longer wooden looking box that could be proudly displayed should you have the shelf space. I opted for the baby blue dial frankly because I don't have this dial color on any other watch. I'm glad I chose this because you can really see the pattern nicely against the color. We have a nice 41mm case size with a 12mm thickness and 47.7mm lug to lug. The watch has a sapphire sandwich feature with AR coating and an exhibition case back. The case is made of 904L stainless steel with a zirconia ceramic bezel and has 200 meters of water resistance. What other color than blue could possibly give you the readout at night here? The BGW9 does a splendid job at capturing the current time and even outlines the bezel for the full dive watch experience. I think I'm beginning to see the wisdom of my purchase. Not that you would ever want to turn this one around and look at the back, but if you did, you'd be pleasantly surprised that its Miyota 9015 movement is slightly decorated and is looking very classy. This 24 joule movement has an attractive 42 hours of power reserve and beats at 4 hertz. Truly the automatic sweet spot. A ball bearing rotor can be seen to keep the time along with a Swiss anchoring inhibitor and a manual hoist. If that isn't enough, it's equipped with a shock absorber also. This is a Japanese workhorse of a movement and is built as they say, Chigao. There are many reasons why I love to wear this out from the subtle baby blue stitching on the band to the satisfying click of the bezel action. It just hits so many marks as a sporty or a classy watch. Its dimensions are near perfect, and I can't help but think of the effort that went into this handcrafted piece. And with craftsmanship like this, I can be assured that no children were used in its production. Ah, Yemma, you're on the fringe edges of microbrand, so I will address the two I have, starting with the Navigraph here. What a splendid looking marine national diver we have. The company goes back a ways to 1948 in Besancon, France, and their watches are timeless. Yema has covered many fields of watchmaking from diving, military, motor racing, space exploration, and sailing. The company has really made waves in literal time. Despite having a brief affair with Seiko from 1988 to 2004, the company has primarily worked directly out of France and continues to kick out new models to choose from even today. This stark color palette really gives off oceanic vibes and the vertically brushed case size of 38.5mm by a 12mm thickness and a 46mm lug to lug are a fun set of specs to sail the seven seas with. Some other features include a double domed sapphire front, screw down crown and sapphire inserted bi-directional 120 click bezel with a 24 hour GMT graduation that can track three time zones and don't forget the 300 meters of water resistance. Are we having fun yet? If not, then when evening falls we should be because this watch has a fabulous BGW9 illuminating its face like an angler fish. Of course we get hands and indices, but we also get bezel love with what I like to call the half moon effect. What a fun way to light the time when only the moon shines down on your schooner. Reversing the watch to the rear we see a raised Marine National logo, but underneath is where the beauty lies with the in-house Yema 3000 caliber movement. This particular movement has a slightly better performance than standard grade calipers at a plus or minus 10 seconds a day and a power reserve of 42 hours. Also, we see 29 joules on this 4 hertz beating time giver, just in case a smooth sweep tickles your lower deck. I was worried that this smaller case size may take away from its presence on the wrist, but quite frankly its bright colors really pop on a sunlit day. 
I've worn it on the bracelet, which is fairly comfortable, but I prefer this parachute style strap with its vibrant colors to match the dial deco. This is quite simply a fun wear from the break of dawn to the blackest of nights. Bravo, Yemma. You've impressed this middle-aged collector. This was a back-to-back -back purchase of the next Yemma I decided to add to the collection. When I saw the Urban Field release, I had to order it to my suburban town. It was literally the next watch they released after the Navigraph. Since we already know the history, we can initiate the spec talk. I opted for the 40mm case size, but there was a 37.5mm available. It has a slim 10.5mm of thickness, which makes for a great under-the-cuff slipper. This particular one has a 48mm lug-to-lug, -lug, while the smaller version is 45mm. I think the sandblasted dial did me in because I love that type of texture and the choice of a silvery polar white was finally a watch brand doing their dial justice. A double domed sapphire crystal is nothing to scoff at either and a conservative 100 meters of water resistance is sufficient if you consider it's not a screw down crown. Our loom presentation isn't remarkable unfortunately. It's kind of there if you squint your eyes, but honestly not really worth talking about even though they used BGW9. It just really falls short here, but makes it up in other fields. Probably the best part of this watch is the reverse view, which through the exhibition shows us a manual Salita SW210-1B Elaboré that is decorated quite nicely. I have to admit that the movement sold me at first, and the dial second. Of course, this beats at 4 Hz, but has a slightly longer power reserve at 45 hours. Even at the 40mm case size, this watch wears a bit small, but its sleek look is very pleasing to the eyes. I am also impressed with the case finishing and polish. I switched out the strap to a velvet black with white stitching to dress it up, but the original strap is still very dressy also. I would call this a milladress style, because it walks the line between the two, but it stays firmly accurate to what it wants to be. It has a bit of an Oris feel, if I must compare it to any other style, but definitely has its own identity. And for our final watch, we will cut right to the chase and say that the Zeppelin brand offers an item that carries its passengers elegantly through the sky, on any day other than May 6th, 1937, that is. I have covered this one before on a recent video, so I won't get into the details and let you watch that. But again, I cannot say enough good things about this affordable brand. It seems that everywhere I go, there is never a person who doesn't like it. Ultimately, the best way to enjoy it is to experience it yourself. With that said, this brings my microbrand collection to a close. Let me know if there is a brand I should try out in the comments below. I would love to have some insight if you've experienced a watch brand that checks all the marks. I know that your time is valuable, so I appreciate you watching, and I want to let you know my time is also valuable. So if you're so kind as to give me a passing sub or like if you enjoyed my video, I would be appreciative and encouraged to continue on and do better in future videos to come. Thanks for tuning in to the madness that is microbrands.